Hey guys, so this is a bit of an unusual one compared to my usual format because this is a long form conversation that was actually meant to be part of my upcoming win-win podcast that's going to be launching in a few weeks. But the topic of it is so urgent that Daniel, who I'm talking to, and I decided to release this early. You will have noticed how mad the rate of AI progress is getting. And I say mad in like every sense of the word. It's incredibly exciting and there's so much cool stuff coming out. Like just, I can't even keep up with it. But at the same time, it's also a little like overwhelming to the extent that, you know, we are creating technologies that we don't even understand and unleashing them and connecting them to the internet. And it feels like the potential risks and harms of that are not being properly internalized into the sort of general calculus of all the different people doing this. So yeah, in this conversation, I'm talking to Daniel Schmachtenberger, who is frankly just one of the smartest people I've ever met. I, if you've been following my more recent content around this topic of Moloch and game theory and when is competition healthy and unhealthy, his thinking has inspired a lot of this content. So it's a real pleasure to be finally talking to him. And specifically, in this conversation, we get into, I think, a sort of blend of topics that haven't really been discussed in this way before. We talk about the nature of game theory and Moloch and how it interplays with our wider sort of capitalistic economic system and how that also then interplays in the development of AI. So if any of those topics interest you, and they should, because if you live on this planet, this will affect you for good or for worse, then you should take the time to watch this conversation in full. Um, it's one of the most fascinating chats I've ever had. It's also one of the most terrifying. So let me know what you think. Yeah, so I am really happy for us to be having this conversation today. You and I have uh, talked about Moloch and the relationship of the uh, kind of Moloch metaphor to the overall state of the world and what I sometimes call the metacrisis for a couple of years now. And you've put out these exceptionally good educational videos on Moloch in uh, expressing itself in different environments <clears throat> in uh, social media and general media. Uh, I hope everybody has watched those. Um, we're in the moment right now where there is this uh, rapid race on the development of artificial intelligence technologies, development and public deployment of them. Uh, this We're recording this shortly after GPT-4 has been publicly released. And uh, then after so many of the other companies that have AI capability have also had to release their large language models in response. And so what I'm actually really wanting to talk about is AI risk and a way of thinking about the totality of the AI risk landscape that is, um, f for me, uh, clarifying and a little different than the way AI risk is usually talked about and maybe unifying across different categories of risk and they give us some insight into how to think about what protecting against it might require. And the uh, Moloch frame, I find, gives incredibly valuable insight in thinking about the AI risk frame and the AGI uh, misalignment issue is very helpful in thinking about the Moloch issue. I think the, the two metaphors clarify each other. And then I think the actual Moloch type dynamics give rise to the AI risk scenarios that I am uh, most concerned about. And so that's what I'm wanting to talk about, which is why I was particularly interested in you and I having this conversation since you're um, holding the mantle of helping the world understand the Moloch dynamics. And uh, so with that, I would love if you would share what the Moloch thing is about for people who don't already know. I know most of your uh, listeners will already know, but uh, why are we referring to it that way? What is the phenomena? Why is it interesting? Sure. So probably the most concise definition I can give is that it's the god of negative sum games, like unhealthy competitive situations. So by that, I mean like a system of bad incentives that incentivize agents within that system, you know, players within that game to sacrifice more and more of their other values in order to win the narrow, you know, win within that narrow domain. In other words, win the game. And by doing this sort of sacrifice of, uh, of all these other values, they're essentially taking selfish actions that externalize harms to everybody else 
um, both within that game and also, you know, even people outside of it, you know, to the wider system as a whole and, and hence making the game a negative something. Okay. So sometimes when uh, trying to describe the generality of the instances aren't already clear it's hard, it's hard for people so could you give a couple examples of what that looks like and why thinking about it as a, a god is at all an interesting frame um mm -hmm. like why is that even the frame that's arising yeah so an example i gave in uh, my first moloch video uh, the beauty wars is about these beauty filters that have now become completely commonplace on Instagram and in fact on most social media platforms. And the reason why these things are sort of so particularly mollicky is that every everyone who's trying to sort of play the, the beauty influencer game or any kind of influencer game, frankly, on these platforms, you get directly rewarded with more likes and follows if your pictures look better, if your face looks better, you know, your complexion's clearer. And these filters started appearing where not only would they make your face look smoother, but they would just like tweak your features in really, really subtle ways. Um, you know, just like make your eyes a little bit bigger and, and, and um, make your face basically converge upon this, whatever these like, what seem like normalized beauty standards, but do successfully seem to hijack people's brains. People do like these and like just you know to show you how like powerful these things are like I would upload a picture of myself that I loved and then I would apply the filter to it and then I would compare the two side by side and I would now no longer like the original picture and therefore it means you know it makes you hate your natural face and yet despite knowing this because you know you know you'd get the direct reward uh of of getting more likes and follows by using these things and then on top of that, you know that everyone else is using them as well. And so if you don't use them, then you're essentially going to get like left behind the curve. You're no longer going to be competitive in, in the influencing game. It's a really classic example of mollicky bad incentives driving a kind of like race to the bottom where everyone ends up miserable. No one wants to be using these things, but feels like they have no choice if they want to stay competitive. Another example would be climate change, pollution, you know, pollution from countries that are trying to grow their GDP, you know, essentially not get left behind their competitors, get left behind other countries um, and externalizing the, the costs of their GDP growth to the atmosphere by polluting with CO2. So essentially a tragedy of the commons type situation. And then a third example is the, the classic arms race. A, a country notices that its competitor is developing some new type of hypersonic missile um, or autonomous weapons and so on. And even if they don't want to ex spend a bunch of their GDP on these very expensive new types of weapons, they feel like they have no choice because if they don't, then they're going to be vulnerable to their enemies. Right. So first it's worth noting that each of these are already abstractions across a lot of cases, right? When we describe an arms race, whether it's these two countries or these two countries, and whether it's on hypersonic missiles or AI weapons or bioweapons, those are each different instances. So the generalization across the class of if anyone is developing better weapons technologies, everybody else has to develop correspondingly the counters to those weapons and the same type of weapons, or they mm -hmm. kind of lose by default because it's a situation where anyone does something that increases their own security in a certain way that also inexorably decreases the security of others unless they do some counter response. Um, so there's lots of different examples of an arms race, but arms races as a whole is already a big generalization. Tragedy of the commons is the same, right? Because we can be looking at a situation mm -hmm. where we're talking about overfishing or whaling or uh, deforestation or desertification or CO2. And these are all cases where uh, the overall commons is being degraded by every actor pursuing their own near-term incentives. Right, the actual incentives laid out in the economic landscape, right. but to recognize that when we look at every environmental issue facing the world, no one is trying to extinct all the species. Nobody is trying to desertify the planet. Nobody wants climate change or the Venusification of the planet, and yet the entire world is making it happen. Right, and that's right. We're doing it like anyway. so. When we look at features of the world that nobody wants. 
and that are bad for everyone, why can't we change them? This is where the Moloch frame comes in, right? Yeah. And we can see that in both the arms race, everyone's like, look, I don't want to necessarily live in the world with the autonomous weapons or the bioweapons, but we have to because they're going to. And if we all make the agreement that we're not going to, how do we know they're keeping the agreement and they're not lying and defecting in some underground military base? So we have to assume under partial information that they are doing the thing because the risk mm -hmm. test would be too high if we assume the other way. So under partial information, we have to assume that worst case, you know, do the same thing. They're assuming the same thing. So because of the inability for trust and coordination, we get this kind of race to the bottom. And uh, the same is true in all these various scenarios. So we see a lot of features of the world that it seems like are comprehensively bad for everyone, trending in a much worse direction. Nobody can really do anything about and nobody wants. And so these properties are kind of the emergent properties of bad coordination. And so you have in other places described Moloch as the god of coordination failures, or basically the principle of coordination failures. The reason to talk about it as a, you know, a god or something is to say like, okay, well, since no agent is trying to make it this way, what is making it this way? Is there some kind of emergent agency or some underlying system dynamics? But we can think of it as underlying system dynamics. And, uh, you know, I think you and I and many people in our sphere both came across this frame from Scott Alexander's Meditations on Moloch paper that references uh, both this great poem on Moloch and, uh, you know, a, a number of pieces in uh, popular culture. Um, and if people haven't read it, everybody should read Scott Alexander's paper on meditations on Moloch. Because um, what it's trying to get to is if every environmental issue from dead zones in the ocean to uh, plastics and waste in the ocean yeah. to all of these issues, nobody wants, but also nobody can stop because the cost of someone stopping it disadvantages them relative to everyone else if everyone else is going to continue to externalize that cost to the commons rather than internalize it and decrease their profit margins. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> so how do we deal with that thing? And if all of the things that are moving us towards increased likelihood for global catastrophic risk, or at least many of them have this in common, this is an underlying feature that we have to really understand, right? And um, so you could call it the god of coordination failures of the unhealthy kind of game dynamics, not the ones that upregulate every, because yes, an arms race upregulates everyone's capacity in a certain way, but it is also <laughs> upregulating a capacity that everyone wishes we didn't have that is only relevant because everybody else has it, right? If we could all just agree right. to decrease military spending by a factor of 10 and reinvest all of that in healthcare and um, infrastructure and everything, the world would be better by everyone's standards. So we're not saying that there are no types of competition that lead to positive some dynamics, but there are these other ones. So um, so it's very interesting, like Moloch can be seen as uh, a, a kind of way of looking at generative dynamics that lead to the overall state of global catastrophic risk, right? That there are other places where I've talked about the meta crisis and tried to give a formalization of it. We can link that here, so I won't do it at length, but I'll just very briefly say, the meta crisis thesis is that we are at a unique time in history where there are an increasing number of global catastrophic risks with increasing probabilities. And that has never been the case like this before, where the attractor state of increasing catastrophe is the most likely attractor state of the future across many different dimensions of how that could play out. And the other attractor state, and maybe I'll, I'll come back to that. I'll explain this one a little bit first. It is uh, a catastrophic risk is not new. Civilizations have faced war and have faced famine and have faced uh, plagues and have faced um, self-induced environmental ruin. Easter Island, in many cases previously, mm -hmm. they were just local. They weren't global. And that was because the overall civilizations were local. We didn't have fully globalized supply chains where everything depended upon six continent you know, radical interdependent right. type things. And when we could destroy a local environment, we couldn't destroy the biosphere writ large or oceans or something. So obviously it's our level of technological capacity that allows us to have a global civilization that allows what happened to all previous civilizations, which was civilizations did go through 
growth curves where they had peaks and then they failed and mm -hmm. they kind of all failed, right? At least that's a, the overarching architecture we see in uh, collapse of complex societies by Tainter and other books like that kind of describe some of the di dynamics. But we are for the first time facing that in a global way. Uh, so it is not unprecedented to think about civilizational collapse. It's just unprecedented to think about it globally. Um, but obviously the Egyptian, the Mayan, the Roman, the, all the previous empires failed for various reasons. Uh, we didn't actually have world ending tech. We didn't have the capacity to ruin everything rapidly until World War II and the bomb. The bomb allowed something where a rapid escalation could destroy kind of everything. That was novel. There were hundreds of 200,000 years of homo sapien history before that. We couldn't destroy everything quickly and then we could. So that was a bright mm -hmm. line in the sand and that was very recent. And we couldn't ruin the entire planetary, we couldn't reach planetary boundaries and mess up the biosphere until industrial tech, but the industrial tech doesn't get there rapidly. Like the nukes, it takes a few hundred years of its proliferation for cumulative effects, right? But we went from half a billion people before the industrial revolution to 8 billion people. We increased the resource consumption per capita moving into the industrial world by 100x plus. And that's utilizing resources from the earth faster than they can be replaced, turning them into trash and pollution faster than they can be processed, ruining the environment on both sides with an exponential economic growth curve that just to keep up with compounding interest has to become exponential and to not overinflate that currency has to equate to more goods and services on a linear materials economy. You don't get to do that thing forever. So industrial tech bound a linear materials economy, turning the earth into trash and pollution through a commodity cycle faster than it can be replenished, attached to an exponential curve of finance, um, utilizing growing industrial tech and globalization is what creates all the planetary boundaries we're facing, of which climate change is one, but species extinction and biodiversity loss and um, on and on and on. The entire planetary boundaries framework is the result of that. That is the result of tech. Without the industrial tech, we couldn't have done that right? So cavemen can't mess up the entire planet, right? Stone age tools, even bronze age tools can't do that, mm -hmm. nor can they have a war that kills everything. So right. then- nor, the nor can they spread memes. They're not informationally connected either. Um, although their memes we'll spread much, that. much slower and more locally, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that is also the result of the tech, right? You and I are talking via satellites, right now, right? Via literal mm -hmm. outer space type communication for this thing to be able to happen on computers that were generated in six continent supply chains and um, that are more advanced than the things that ran the Manhattan Project um, that are available to all of us. And, but so, so the cumulative effects of industrial tech bring us to planetary boundaries and kind of increasing fragility where there used to be a lot of people who lived on local subsistence, not dependent on the total grid. And there were a lot less total people. Now there's a lot more total people and they're almost all dependent on the grid, not local subsistence. Mm -hmm. So the fragility of those things is radically higher. So you both get fragility of the planet and fragility of the human life support systems multiplied by a lot more people, which can of course also escalate to violence when things start to break down, things like that. So uh, then you've get the bomb, is the example of the first fully existential tech. And for the first time in history, we actually had to make an entire world system to not use our new tech. Whereas before that, every time we had new tech, there was always a race to deploy it as fast as we could for strategic advantage. Mm -hmm. This is a situation where nobody can win, everybody loses. So mutually assured destruction and the entire post-World War II world of the Breadwoods financial system, the UN, et cetera, was all, how do we make a world system that doesn't do that thing? Um, right. And it happens to be that that was successful, which is why we haven't had a kinetic World War III since then. We're closer than ever to that right now um, with <clears throat> a proxy war between NATO and Russia being as close to not proxied as it is and other things in the horizon. But um, mutually assured destruction doesn't work when you have many, many players that have catastrophe weapons and many types of catastrophe weapons, right. which is the scenario we have now. It's like a lo it's like a local it's, it's a local minimum, but there's like ton it's it's a very tiny uh, minimum where it just a little nudge and it could fall off down the hill. There's many routes for it to, to topple off down the hill. Yeah, yeah. So. And the the other thing is that a major part of the post World War II solution was one of the major reasons for war, as you mentioned before, was 
competition over resources. And if major nations want to be able to grow their economic quality of life for everybody, i.e. they want more stuff, to not have to invade each other to take their stuff, how can everybody get more stuff simultaneously? Well, we can create an exponential monetary system <laughs> and globalization and free trade and much more industrialization and just take stuff from nature faster so that everybody can have more stuff exponentially, right? Super positive sum dynamic. Except you can't take stuff from nature forever and be able to keep doing that. So you start hitting planetary boundaries and we're right at that point. And then when our own inability to keep growing without taking other people's stuff comes, now the conflict type dynamic. So a part to so the, the planetary boundaries we're facing are actually partially the nature the result of the solution to not World War III, which is all, why also the degrowthers have to factor that degrowth ends up driving World War III if you don't have other ways of mm -hmm. tending to the fact that many people would not voluntarily choose austerity in the presence of less stuff. They would choose war in the other if they thought they could win. But then the sort of the, so then the flip side argument is, is like, okay, so yes, to an extent, technology has gotten us into this mess, but it sounds like we should pile on more technology to expand those essentially those planetary boundaries um to be able to more efficiently extract resources and thus sort of keep the house of cards going no we can say for sure that luddite solutions don't work even if they would be better because unless because of multipolar traps because of moloch because the tech equals power and if somebody says hey this tech is ca causing harm so we're not going to do it they also just lose in the short term to whoever does, right? I see. And so, okay, we think AI weapons are bad, so we're not going to build them. We think, okay, great, then you're going to be destroyed by whoever does. So, um, right. so we, unless you can get universal agreement, you can't just lose an arms race. And this has been one of the challenges of whether it was China engaging with Tibet, whether it was colonialists engaging with the Native Americans, whether it was Genghis Khan or any of his guys engaging with more peaceful tribes that were smaller, uh, the peaceful tribes lose at war. And they also lose at population games, right? Like right. The, the ones that are going to unrenewably use the planet to grow their population faster. So we are in this unique situation where the result of that is an exponentiation, right? It's, it's the who has made it through are the people that both win at war and win at economic growth. And so we have radically more warfare, like total warfare potential, and that is radically more distributed and radically more externalities on the environment and all the fragilities associated. And that situation ends up leading to catastrophic breakdown of everything. So basically, so far, the answer has been win at the race or lose. The race itself is self-terminating. This is kind of the metacrisis hypothesis. So we take the next step, and not only did the post-World War II model in, in doing the good thing of we didn't have nuclear war yet, right? We didn't have a kinetic war between superpowers. It, al it also increased total global fragility, increased the movement towards all the planetary boundaries. And mm -hmm. we proliferated a heap of other technologies that are truly catastrophic now that unlike nukes are not easy to control. Nukes are extremely hard to make. Uranium is not in many places. It's hard to enrich. You can see where it is with satellites because it's radioactive. And so you can limit it and only have a G9 or whatever that actually has nuclear capabilities. And limiting Iran and many countries from getting it has been a major part of the world order, right? Um, but when we're talking about cyber weapons or drone weapons or bioweapons or the types of attacks that AI makes possible or other types of exponential tech, these do not require... Uh, something that has to be mined in one particular area in the same way. These do mm -hmm. not require nation, like top level nation state level capabilities. Once they're developed for any purpose, they're pretty much more easily accessible. And <clears throat> what that means is, and we always talk about exponential tech, democratizing power, right? Decentralizing and democratizing and decentralized and democratize sounds nice in some ways when you don't like concentrations of power and the abuses therein, but the democratization of catastrophe weapons is, has a downside. And one is when we're talking about not just a few nation states, but lots of nation states and non-state actors and people who you can't even tell whom having those capabilities. You can't put mutual mm -hmm. destruction or force Nash equilibriums in the same way. 
um, what it portends for kind of just disgruntled misanthropes of which there are more as the other issues are advancing and technological mm. unemployment increases and people migrating because of climate change increases and all those types of things. Right. Um, and then some of the exponential techs just even cause the ability to cause pretty catastrophic stuff by accident, right? Whether COVID was from a lab leak or not, the idea that if you're doing gain of function research and synthetic, synthetic bio in a lab that it can leak and as you're doing lots more of it that the probability of that increases like right. that's not even intentional that's and as easy as it is for a lab leak you know of that type it's way easier for a ai leak because it's connected to the internet it's actually almost very hard not to have those types of things happen so <clears throat> what we're saying is that we're at a novel point in history that world war ii was a novel point first truly catastrophe weapon now we're at the point where we have multiple types of catastrophe weapons, many actors that have them, no good force Nash equilibrium, planetary boundaries, fragility, and that we're not saying that lots of things aren't getting better. Of course, all of the Pinker and Friends arguments about the things that are getting better are. The point is that they're getting better at the cost of other things that are being made worse, where externalities mm -hmm. are being driven. The things that are being made worse are getting very near criticality points and tipping points that change the game fundamentally. So you have a world of increased catastrophic risk. And of course, you have cascades between these because you can have <clears throat> well before climate change and whether it's just from CO2 or whether it's from the localized effects of deforestation or whatever, um, we do have ex increasing extreme weather events. So then you get human migration. And do we see likely possibilities for much larger amount of human migration in the near future? Yes. And can that lead to resource wars, which can lead to escalating wars if they hit already tense geopolitical environments, whether it's India, Pakistan, or whether it's, you know, so many issues like that. Um, <clears throat> so we can see that whether we're talking about large scale military dynamics or breakdown of supply chains and human systems or what exponential tech can add, they all actually kind of cascade into each other. They have the capacity. So there is some need to tend to and that what you do to make one of them better can often make another one worse, right? So people will mm -hmm. propose, hey, we need to tax carbon heavily and properly price carbon where the, the price of the tax allows us to sequester the CO2. But if everyone doesn't internationally do it and say the US does or Europe does and China doesn't, and that equals a radical change to GDP, which gets reinvested in military plus overall geopolitical diplomacy, then you're also changing the balance of power in the world as a result. And mm -hmm. so this is one of these classic cases where the way you make one thing better can make other things worse. So how do you kind of factor all that together? So this is, I, I took longer than I wanted, but that's roughly the meta crisis thesis, right? And so Moloch mm -hmm. is one way of looking at one of the generative dynamics that gives rise to this. A comment that often arises on a lot of my videos I've noticed is that people really, you know, they're sensing that there is some malevolent force that is, you know, essentially making the world, you know, making it hard for people to coordinate, making it so that we seem to be trending more towards like greater militarization and greater war, you know, risk of war and so on. But they can't, they, they end up ascribing it to like, you know, like a QAnon type theory or something like that. You know, it's like, oh, it's this shadowy cabal of elites. It's the elites who are driving this and so on. It's like, there's some truth to that in that like elites have more power and therefore have a little bit more responsibility in driving a monarchy process. But it, it, there's no, I wish there was a centralized cabal who were like drawing, because then at least then we'd have some, some easier way. It's like, okay, we've got, we know who the enemy is and the enemy is physical and real and like, therefore you could take it out. But it's, it's more distributed than that because it's, it's this like nebulous collection of bad incentives that we happen to call Moloch because we need to give it a name. We need to give it a face so that we can understand it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I, I think it's an, it, kind of an important point to, 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 to sort of hammer home to people because they, they're looking for an enemy and they're looking for a scapegoat, but all the while that they keep blaming it on like constantly just purely blaming it on the elites, they're missing. That's not going to solve the problem. You can kill all the elites and Moloch will still be there. Yes. So this is why looking at the Moloch type dynamics, the coordination failures are very useful for understanding lots of features of the world is that, um, the, in, the various environmental issues, the various market type races that end up being races 
to the bottom or that bring way more risk. I'll give you another great example with the race to AI right now or the ones with social media that happened. The, there's a perverse incentive to focus more on the opportunity and less on the risk right. of any new technology, even though any new technology will do both. Because if I say, whoa, there might be real risk in this. This is very powerful. People could use this for various purposes. We want to do a real thorough deep risk analysis before releasing this thing and not release it wrongly. And we want to do some real safe to fail testing. And someone else is like, we do some bullshit box checking risk analysis and then talk about all the awesome upsides and rush ahead. They get first mover advantage. They get more mm -hmm. um, investment. investment. They get Metcalf law and winning the network dynamics. Yep. Yep. And so there is a perverse incentive against thoughtful consideration and precautionary principle. And so we see that lead got put in gasoline for some really fucking simple thing of engine knocking that knocked a billion points of IQ off the planet and 4x the aggressiveness of everybody by literally atomizing lead that we had to pull out of deep ores and brain toxicifying the whole planet. And it took like 80 years before we finally outlawed the thing. And the effects that that had on the entire population, the choice they made are irreversible. And the same with DDT and parathion and malathion and on and on, where we or cigarettes, where we don't regulate the thing until way after the harms have been so clear. But as we're getting tech that has... And, and Elon and many people have talked about this for a long time as we're, if, when we're dealing with AI, when we're dealing with synthetic bio, when we're dealing with technology that has rapidly, much more rapid and much more scaled and consequential and complex types of effects. If you wait until it hits a certain point to try to regulate, it's too late. Now you have mm -hmm. radical irreversibility. And um, so the, we saw, we saw ChatGPT get to 100 million users in a fraction of the time that it took TikTok or Facebook or anyone previously. And obviously, it has a lot more total power and things that it can do. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so uh, we this isn't a situation where we want to have an, an anti-incentive against precautionary principle, maximum incentive on race, where the regulators are inherently slower and more stumbly than the um, ones incentivizing it. Right? Like there's, that, that is also part of the Moloch dynamic which starts to bring us to the AI conversation. Hmm. Did you want to talk about the relation between Moloch and capitalism before we get to that? Yeah. Um, I'll start by saying the competition, the you know Cold War between the USSR and the USA was not, which was being framed as two different political economies, right? Communism and capitalism and competition was not capitalism, right? And the fucked up things that were happening inside of the USSR were not capitalism. So mm -hmm. we're not talking like the critique that we're about to offer of capitalism is not saying some previous economic system or political economy was better. And actually Moloch instantiated itself through those systems as well capitalism was more effective and it did get selected because it was more effective at both good things and fucked up things, right? Which is mm -hmm. kind of what you mentioned that it wins a war, but it has to sacrifice important stuff to do so. So the thing that, that can be reductionist and win certain critical metrics, but harm other stuff in the process where eventually the cumulative effects of those harms are either catastrophe or dystopia a world that nobody really wants. And those are the two primary attractors right now. You have catastrophes and to prevent all the catastrophes, to make sure that people can't build catastrophe weapons in their basement, what type of surveillance is needed to make sure that you have enough controls on all the things. If you really have the ability to control the entire landscape of things that could lead to catastrophic risks that are radically decentralized, most of those solutions look pretty dystopic. And so we mm -hmm. want a future, a third attractor future that is neither catastrophes nor dystopias. And without saying what it is first, let's just say that it's not those things. And we can almost all universally agree that we would prefer not those things, which means that we need something that has the power to be able to prevent catastrophic risk, but also needs checks and balances on its own power. Right, it doesn't have unchecked right. power and and capturability or corruption or those types of dynamics that are then uncheckable. It's beyond the scope of this video to talk about what that third attractor solution is. Um, but uh, so we have, you know, when we talk about capitalism as a kind of dominant global economic system, and of course we don't have pure laissez-faire capitalism. We have this kind of hybrid um, political economy, but 
roughly this thing. It does not subsume all of Moloch. Like we said, Moloch was operating under feudalism and under communism and under right. other systems and in the competitions between them. It is more fair to think of it as kind of um, the god of game theory. Uh, mm -hmm. But as capitalism being such a powerful part of that stack, we can think of it as a metaphor for a moment and say capitalism is... Well, let's just start by the a couple key aspects of the incentive. Dynamics. Vast majority of human history and tribal type uh, dynamics pre-agriculture, all of our kind of genetic fitness in that environment, we didn't have the ability to store a lot of surplus, right? That happened post the plow and grain and storage mm -hmm. technologies and whatever. Uh, in which case, there were all these kind of sayings with various tribes, the best place to store extra food is in your neighbor's belly because rots otherwise and, you know, et cetera, and tribe inner invested in. So, but as soon as we start getting to uh, private property ownership and the ability for a lot of surplus, where I could differentially make it through a famine better than somebody else, I could have a higher quality of life than somebody else, I could pass on inheritance. Um, as soon as I have private property, as a possibility, now there is an incentive to try to turn more of nature into my private property, right? And to try to turn more of other people's actions in my private property. But when the property is actual, real commodities and goods, or the agreements with people who can do services, um, let's stick with goods because it's easier for right now. Uh, there's a diminishing return on the value of any of those based on the illiquidity of them or the difficulty of moving them. I get more lumber at a certain point. I have more lumber than I can use, and I can't even move it around to sell all that quickly. And so I don't really want all that much more of it, right? And the same mm -hmm. would be true with ore of a certain kind or whatever. But as soon as we move to a kind of a currency-mediated system where I can sell it in real time and turn it all into something that has no intrinsic value, but the optionality for every form of value. Well, now there's no... Like fungibility. Fungibility. Now, yeah. and obviously we started with things that had intrinsic value, but still got used to mediate it like gold. But then, you know, we got to fiat. So I'm just going to do the huge jump to fiat because mm -hmm. it's the current system. Even though it has no intrinsic value, what it, the value that it has is maximum speed of optionality. Right? Maximum optionality and maximum kind of liquidity mm. and speed. And so in that situation, there's no diminishing return on getting more. Like more is more, right? And uh, whether I want to convert that money into military power or convert it into public opinion through media and campaigns and stuff or convert it into technological power of one kind or another kind or land ownership, I, the money allows me the ability to do all that. So you can think of it as just units of power or units of game theory right? Units of mm. OODA loop. And um, <clears throat> then when you add money on money dynamics to it, compounding interest as the beginning, then of course, all of the financial services that um, become possible with more, more capital, but just compounding interest, not only is there not a diminishing response to as I get more and more ore, it becomes less valuable to me because I can't use it fast enough. Now, as I get more money, it is actually exponentially making money on itself. So when I have private property, I have the ability to turn all of that into fungible units of capital, and it makes money on itself. There is now a maximum incentive to turn as much of the world as possible into capital in my holding. And because other people are, and they could use that against me, there is now an arms race for me to do it faster than that guy, right? Mm. And that's decentralized. And... Um, now, of course, we can see that when we're talking about there are types of power that don't directly just relate to dollars, right? The number of Twitter following is one or the amount of covert political influence or, um, uh, you know, many, many other things. There are military generals that have more total power than the amount of money they have, but obviously they influence a huge amount of money in terms of military assets, how much they cost and things like that. Um, and so this is why I say I don't want to reduce it exclusively to money, but if we had to pick a single metric that has the most kind of optionality for all other types of metrics, right. that would be the one. So if, if we're thinking about Moloch as a whole, <clears throat> we can see that whether we're talking about the environmental issues 
or whether we're talking about the increasing polarization because of social media algorithms or whether we're talking about um, you know, any of these things, the rapid race that is not orienting towards safety enough on new technologies, that this set of dynamics is underneath it, right? And this is why that kind of frame Scott Alexander and others have put forward, which is who is engineering this thing? Well, Moloch is engineering this thing, right? Like that, mm. that thing overall. And now this is where I want to stop and go into the what is a misaligned AGI, what is a paperclip maximizer for a moment, because it actually makes Moloch clearer and then Moloch makes it clearer. Do you want to um, construct the kind of paperclip maximizer scenario for people? Um, you know a lot of the people in the kind of AI risk space. So the paperclip maximizer is like a thought experiment that is basically of like an extreme super intelligence gone wrong. Because just because you can build something that is by definition super intelligent, you know, in that it's, you know, and, and if we de define intelligence in what I think is the best definition, which is uh, the ability to optimize and navigate a very broad range of terrains in order to achieve whatever your goals are. So if we can achieve, you know, define intelligence as that, your ability to basically get stuff done across a wide range of environments. Um, that does not necessarily guarantee that you also have the wisdom to decide what your goals should be in the first place. Um, it's called the orthogonality thesis, the idea that like, you know, you know, maybe intelligence and wisdom are perfectly aligned, but there's actually a very pos large possibility that they are completely unaligned. You know, they're, they're just orthogonal to one another. And so the paperclip maximizer is like the extreme, you know, a, a silly, uh, example of that into you know a, a, an arbitrary example whereby you you know let's say you want to build um a machine you you, you are prefer, you you have a factory that builds paper clips um and then you happen to get hold of a super intelligence um that will help you build them as fast as possible so you make maximum profit um your super intelligence then is able to because it's so capable at navigating a broad range of goals uh turn every atom that it comes across into more paper clips uh, until the universe becomes tiled with them um so yeah that's it's basically a very somewhat oversimplified but at the same time kind of comically salient example of a deeply misaligned uh but nonetheless super intelligent system right so um just to construct a couple key parts of it, paperclip is obviously a, a, a silly and kind of cute on purpose example of whatever it is, right? Whatever commodity, whatever right. widget that you're optimizing for. And without even saying super intelligence, let's just say increasingly good, increasingly competent and generalizable artificial intelligence gets applied to the corporation, which is already mm -hmm. happening everywhere. And it has just two features, which is it can work to achieve a goal, whatever its objective function is. In this case, make more paper clips. And it can recursively improve itself so it gets better at doing that thing. That's key, right? Um, so of course, at first it does a bunch of stuff that we want. It figures out how to turn off lights when people aren't there to save cost and energy and how to make more efficient supply chains and negotiate better deals and all those kinds of things and it just makes a more efficient business. And of course, the reducto ad absurdum is once it has done all of the easy good stuff, it still has the objective function, make more paper clips. And mm. then it has to start doing stuff that is not just obviously easy good, right? Where there's some trade-offs that are happening somewhere else, but the things that are being harmed are not part of its objective function, right? Its objective function isn't make the most paper clips while don't do any harm, not do harm anywhere else. Because that the while don't do harm anywhere else is actually incredibly hard to specify in an right. easy computational way, which is the heart of what we'd call you know, the alignment problem. And so if you did have something that could recursively increase its ability to achieve a goal like that, and then had enough generalized intelligence that it could outcompete anyone that was competing against it, right? It could increase its capability faster than say we as humans could. And we're like, oh fuck, we don't want you to be making paper clips out of our food sources. We don't want you to be making paper clips out of, but it figures out how to beat us at those games. Then yes, eventually it just starts turning everything into the substrate for paper clips. And in general, the idea is you have an objective function, whatever the AI is optimizing for, whatever that is. The 
Um, and there's different ways that people will describe it in nuance. And, you know, it's worth reading Yudkowsky and Bostrom and the other, you know, kind of um, seminal thinkers on what the nature of the AGI alignment problem is. But roughly, if you have an artificial intelligence that is general and autonomous, autonomous meaning it is working on its own. You don't have to keep giving it prompts, right? It's doing its own thing. It has agency. Mm -hmm and where you can't pull the plug on it, right? That's a key part. And it can upgrade its own capability to do whatever it is that it's seeking to do. And it can upgrade its capability faster than we can because the smarter one then is capable of making an even smarter one. And we already see early signs of this. We already see AI starting to create better internal AI functions to be able to achieve their um, mm -hmm. the goals that are set for them. The idea of do we want an autonomous general intelligence that is comprehensively smarter than us, that is trying to fulfill a goal before we know that its fulfillment of that goal isn't going to really mess stuff up for us, right? And we're like, no, no, we don't want that thing, right? We would like to prevent that um, because it's entirely possible that it could do some uh, things that are totally not what we want in pursuing that goal. So obviously, if its goal was to maximize GDP, there's a lot of nasty ways to maximize GDP. It can go up on, with war. It can go up with addiction. It can mm. go up with... And whatever it is that the objective function is, there's a lot of perverse instantiations of that thing being fulfilled in a way that totally messes up other stuff. And so the AGI alignment question is, can we actually ensure that before the thing is truly a general autonomous intelligence, that it is aligned, uh, aligned with our interests, our intention, our good or something? What the nature of alignment means is actually a deep question. I'm going to put that on hold for a moment, but roughly aligned with us such that a, that much power would be a safe thing for us to have exist. And what I, the thought experiment of an intelligence that was, say, as much more intelligent than us as we are than chimps or ants or whatever, uh, looking at how our increase in intelligence has boded for all the other inhabitants of the planet. Uh, uh, you know, that's a very concerning thought. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where I want to actually use the analogy of that. An autonomous, so it's doing stuff on its own, right? It's, it, it's autopoetic, mm -hmm. it's self-authoring, it's self-upgrading, and it's orienting towards an objective function. And I would basically like to say that you could call the current global system, and we just to simplify it, let's call it global capitalism, even though it's not that. Um, <clears throat> we Calling it Moloch would be better, right? Mm -hmm. Um but let's just talk about the capitalism part because the metrics are kind of clear. You could say that it is already a general autopoetic superintelligence. It is has an objective function, which is to convert as much of the world, people's creativity, ideas, labor, natural resources, everything into capital. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so that's the paper clips, right? And which is interesting because it has no real value, just optionality for real value. And there's always this assumption that there's more real value out there, but that stops being true forever, right? So if I, the tree sequesters CO2 and produces oxygen and I need to breathe oxygen and it does a lot of other important things like supports pollinators and cleans the water and stabilizes topsoil and all these things for me. But <clears throat> if I cut the tree down, turn it into lumber, there's still enough oxygen for me. I didn't actually ruin my, if I cut the whole acre of trees down, there's still oxygen. In fact, there's no differentially seeming less oxygen for me doing that. But now I have the money of all the, the lumber of these trees and I can do real tangible shit for me and my family or my corporation with that. And so the optionality value I get allows me to still access real value, but I'm destroying real value in the process. Someone can say, well, you're not destroying it because you're making lumber. Well, yes, lumber is actually radically less complex than a tree that has less total types mm -hmm. of value that it does. So we're converting the self-organizing, self-repairing complex world and into an increasingly simple or complicated, fragile world that has less types of value to less types of actors. The mm -hmm. tree has value of many different types to many different types of actors, right? So you can't just say, well, it's carbon sequestration. 
that no, it's it's stabilizing topsoil. Yeah, a, a million things. Biodiversity, etc. Yeah. So when we talk about artificial intelligence, we talk about what type of computer system it runs on. It, it, hardware wise, it runs on CPUs or GPUs or TPUs or whatever it is, and um, what type of algorithms that it runs. And uh, so what's it's interesting that we can already say humans are general intelligence and capitalism is running parallel process across all the humans, right? And we know when you think about the cloud and why parallel process was so powerful, it's also why GPUs are mm. so powerful. Um, capitalism is basically as a decentralized incentive system, incentivizing all humans to both do novelty search, figure out new ways of making money and exploitation, take the existing ways and do the most of them that you can. Those that do better at it get more influence in the system and in turn influence the system in ways that support them to do more of it. Those that oppose the system are also opposing those who are doing well at the system. So even though the system as a whole doesn't have agency, those who do keep in check those that would oppose them. So it is as if the system has agency and you go from barter to currency, to fiat currency, to uh, fractional reserve banking, to AI high-speed trading of derivatives and credit default swaps. And that is basically the recursive upregulation of the algorithm, right? It is getting more and more capable of doing more and more financialization of the world to incentivize mm -hmm. people to do more and more things. So you can see that you've got something that is already running on all these general intelligences and as a result is super intelligent it is has an objective function the objective function is misaligned with the long-term well-being of the world and it advances narrow value metrics at the ex and it's not that like you know the the but everything is getting better pinker t rossling type arguments are like saying but look at how many paper clips we have Aren't we all stoked that we're getting cheaper paper clips? And <clears throat> multiply by all the types of paper clips. Like, yes, narrow metrics are being advanced at the cost of lots of wide metrics that end up being critical to either the breakdown of life support so you get catastrophe or the breakdown of the quality of life you get dystopia. How would that then sort of using that definition apply to the, the difficulty of the alignment problem with an AGI? So here's the thing where we think about the super intelligence and a misaligned super intelligence is a very scary idea. And if you want a sense beyond the silly paperclip maximizer, of how scary it is, um, read some of people like Eliezer Yudkowsky and others on what AGI misalignment means, super intelligence misalignment means. Um, before we go all the way to Moloch, we could already say that collectives of lots of people interacting in particular ways, whether we say a public corporation or say a nation state, let's say we take a large public corporation, right? Well beyond what we have evolutionary history for. We had evolutionary history for tribal type size things below the Dunbar number where everybody could talk to everybody. So possibly the human scale ethics and whatever could perpetuate through the whole thing. At much larger scale, it changes, which is why the beginning of large civilizations started to have different properties. Um, so you take a public corporation. Who's in control of it? Kind of nobody, right? Like the people in the corporation answer up to the executive team, answer to the CEO, the CEO answers to the board, the board answers to the shareholders. Right. The, the board has a fiduciary responsibility to maximize profit returns to shareholders. The shareholders are pension funds and whatever, where the managers of the shareholders are trying to get money back to the 401ks and the whoever is in there. There end up being pieces of law that are bound up through the whole thing, which is the, the liability limiting status of the corporation that can privatize gains and socialize losses and the fiduciary responsibility of the uh, directors to maximize shareholder profit and the on and on. So who's really in charge of it? You can get rid of a CEO and put a new one in. You can get rid of a director, put a new one in. You can sell some of the shares, get a new shareholder. It's kind of this thing that gets set in motion where it has an objective function, which is now maximized profit within the domain of how it figured out how to do that thing. And so, but because it is engaging, it's running on all these human intelligences, which are already general intelligence. So it can do things that the humans can do, plus things that none of those humans on their own could do. 
right? It takes a lot of humans together to do a large Hadron Collider or a Hubble or an Exxon, right? It has a capacity that nobody could do on its own. So it is super intelligent. It is beyond human intelligence in that way, not just in a narrow way because it's engaging people that are already generally intelligent. And then beyond just that, it's already engaging computation. So it's engaging the narrow but very powerful data processing. And now we add AI to that. And so we can say already that a nation state or a public corporation is kind of a cybernetic general intelligence that is already misaligned. Can, can you just define what you mean by cybernetic? Cybernetic is just the field of study for any type of system that kind of self-regulates. Right, how the control mechanisms okay. work, how the regulatory mechanisms work. So has a corporation yeah. has feedback loops, it has feed forward loops, it has regulatory processes to be able to maintain what it's doing and upgrade what it's doing. Right? Nation safe okay. has that any. And but it's it is dealing with internal but also external pressures that force it to be what it is. Maybe mm -hmm. Google didn't want to release its large language model yet. But as soon as its business model gets attacked by Microsoft releasing one and adding it to being in the possibility of search, then it has to. And so this is where the multipolar trap, the Molochian type dynamic comes in, is <clears throat> the individual organization is not totally sovereign because it's for it to keep existing. It has to deal with the pressures defined by others. And mm -hmm. so either a sociopath can start something that then everybody has to deal with or everyone assuming the other one is about to do it next and no sociopath has a situation that is functionally sociopathic. We talk about a corporate person, 14th Amendment, kind of giving personhood rights to a corporation in this weird way. If we were to talk, so this, there's already a framework for thinking of it as an agent, right? The superintelligence as an agent, but the fiduciary responsibility to maximize profit makes it kind of an obligate sociopath, right? That kind of thing. Um, has to take the opportunities it has so long as it is not illegal within the confines of law, but it can work to change law, which is what all, why all big corporations lobby, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that ends up being one of the very profitable things that a company does is rather than the regulator limiting it too much, it figuring out how to get the regulator to change regulation more aligned with its interests. Um, and so for it to say, hey, uh, a shareholder profit maximization fiduciary responsibility in an oil, oil company and solving climate change are incommensurable. A shareholder fiduciary um, profit maximization in military industrial contractors and a world of peace that would denecessitate all right. the demand are incommensurable, right? And mm -hmm. so um, then those competing with each other, right? So then any of the A groups are like, hey, I can't really do safety because the other ones, we all kind of have to race at this. And then maybe the whole US says, we don't want to regulate it because we would rather our guys get there before China gets there because um, whoever has it's going to run the world and we'd at least like it to be US companies. And so that Molochian dynamic makes it to where each of these cybernetic superintelligences interacting with each other creates a meta cybernetic superintelligence that you can call Moloch, right? Which is why mm. I wanted to talk with you about it is you can see Moloch as an emergent property of the systems of incentives and the uh, dynamics of coordination that are built into the system where it is employing human general intelligence it's employing computational capabilities and increasingly artificial intelligence and the whole rest of our tech stack it is up regulating through competitive dynamics but up regulating in this narrow benefit kind of way and so we could say this thing that is driving climate change and driving species extinction and dead zones and oceans and coral loss and desertification and arms races and polarization and all like that. That is a misaligned super intelligence that nobody can pull the plug on. It's already autonomous. It's already nobody can pull the plug. And it is building AI. Because corporations... See, it's not actually the people. It's not actually the people within. They think they're the ones building it. 
Well, but, but they're building it within corporations that have a fiduciary responsibility for profit maximization right. that are in multipolar traps with other companies that are racing to do it, that mm -hmm. have to look at how do we commercialize this thing, whatever it is, right? Um, or they're building it within nation states that have to be able to compete with another nation state. And w what that means is that some narrow value metrics that define what wins the competition get prioritized it's over wide nice. value yeah. metrics. And so it is fair to say that we already have a misaligned autopoetic superintelligence running the world, running all, running on and running all of the people to various degrees. It is already employing all of the computational power. It is developing more computational power in AI. The AI is being built by it in service of itself. So the AI risk scenario that Yudkowsky or Bostrom or others put forward of a thing where you can't pull the plug, it is upgrading its capacity to do what it does, it has an objective function it's pursuing, but it harms stuff that we wouldn't want harmed in its objective function in the pursuit of it. What I'm arguing is that we are already there, and it is our world system, and that AI is simply accelerating it, and that we don't have to get to AGI to have the effect of it, because you already have GI. We already have general intelligence in the form of the corporations, nation states, and the overall mm -hmm. system, where then adding AI, even if it is not fully generalized to that system, you already have something that is autonomous in general that is now getting increasingly potent capacities, even if it's within a bunch of narrow domains, right? And so <clears throat> before we get to the case of just autonomous AI be, being its own risk, the existing AI in this landscape is driving the entire risk landscape, is driving the overall, is accelerating the topology that is already in place. And this is why I said I think the un misaligned AGI as a thought experiment helps people understand Moloch. But what the reality of right. Moloch helps people understand that without getting to a total AGI, that the nature of the risk there is already happening. Then with that, we have to say, what would it take to prevent those risks? And it's a different calculus. It's a different way of thinking about it. So what do we do? <laughs> Let me make it a little bit more tangible first and talk about sub-AGI within this context, this Molochian metacrisis context, mm -hmm. what do the actual risks of AI look like? I'll give a few different categorizations. And I wanna say, I am not an AI alignment expert or a uh, AI risk expert. There are a lot of experts at places like Miri and Redwood and um, other places that I think people should listen to, pay a lot of attention to. I'm familiar enough with those arguments and then very specifically with the metacrisis argument to see how it relates. And that's what I'm speaking to here. Um, there's something very unique about AI relative to all other forms of technology. I'll speak to the deeper part in a moment, but to begin with, synthetic biology is very powerful. Like obviously it's very, very powerful. Uh, there are, are awesome applications. There are awful applications. Um, but synthetic bio does not automatically give us the ability to make better drones. It doesn't give us the ability to make better high-speed trading. It doesn't give us the ability to make better nukes. Mm. Nukes don't automatically give us better bioweapons. AI gives us better all of them, right? right? That's an important thing is that AI has the capacity to do optimization across all the things, which means the good things, which is what we all want. We want to have AI work on protein folding for immuno oncology to cure cancer and on um, receptor sites for new drug discovery and to make supply chains more efficient and things like that. <clears throat> but everything that AI can optimize, it can also break. You run it in reverse, right? The, the AI that was doing drug discovery, I think it was Oak Ridge National Laboratories, was ran in reverse and came up with a bunch of chemical weapons very rapidly. And- uh, a minus sign in front of it, essentially. <laughs> and an AI that can optimize supply chains can also optimize exactly how to break them, right? Can optimize mm -hmm. terrorist attacks on them, even just through cyber and things like that. Right. A AI that can do protein folding for amino oncology can also make fucked up bioweapons. 
And so the first principle is that as you, it's very hard to advance AI, right? It takes massive GPU farms. It takes only a few companies in the world that can even do the chip manufacturing to do that kind of thing. Um, it takes a lot of computer science talent, massive amounts of data, and et cetera. But once it's developed and then it is connected to the internet, like a large language model can run on a lot less compute than it's trained on. It takes a lot to train. It doesn't take that much to run it. Right. That's a big deal. And it takes a lot to figure it out. Once it's been figured out and you publish the paper, it's, and this is one of the key things is... It's like building software. You know, it's very hard to build. You know, you need programming knowledge and so on to build a software. But once you've built it and you've built the sort of user interface... Any, any old schmuck can use it and get and like reap the benefits from it. So yeah. if you have a company like a Google or an OpenAI or whatever that says, hey, we're going to put safety parameters on this, I think there's a bunch of arguments against why that is, even if they could do it, won't be adequate, but they can't because, um, you know, you had the, I think it was Llama or Alpaca, the um, Stanford meta one that ended up getting leaked through some GitHub leak. And then somebody yeah, got Facebook's it, Lama. downloaded yeah. it onto a computer, Fortune. started sharing it. And that means the full power of something that probably cost tens of millions of dollars to train is now unlocked and will be available for anybody to use for all the purposes. So the safety is not there. There are mm. some projects working on decentralized AI that are about to make at least GPT 3.5 level kind of unlocked widely available. That thing is impossible to avoid. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so the thing to understand is that it takes a lot of work to develop the new capacity. Once it's developed, the barrier of entry to be able to do the things that it allows to be done has been radically lowered for everybody. That all the good things come from that. We can all do more creative stuff. That's exciting. All the bad things come from that. And so there's this principle that's, we could say all technology is dual use, right? You're developing it for some positive purpose, but it has a military application, but it's not just dual. Every technology is kind of omni-use, meaning mm. it will get used for all the uses that people have incentives to use it for who are capable of using it. So however much you lower the barrier of entry, anyone who can go into that barrier of entry now will use it for the things they have incentives for. So you develop it for, we're going to, cure cancer but now you've got that ability for biological engineering really easily available widely right mm -hmm. um and so i think the the th couple things the first thing to understand about ai is ai can make better cyber weapons better nuclear weapons better drone weapons better all of those things better info weapons better population centric weapons and so it increases the capacity to increase all the other risks in a way no other thing does. Mm -hmm. You could kind of say, well, oil does that, right? Energy, every industry needs energy. Well, yeah, but it's not doing the novelty search part of figuring out new, better ways to make those domains. It's simply just allowing them to do more of it, right? The AI mm -hmm. both allows you to scale the stuff, but also allows the innovation of way new, better stuff. So that's novel. Mm -hmm. That's a very <laughs> novel thing about it. So the first principle is anything AI can optimize can break. You develop it for one purpose. It'll get used for all the purposes that anybody can figure out how to use it for. You try to make safeties and whatever, but you create an incentive now for a bunch of cat and mouse type dynamics on how to utilize that. And obviously we can think about the ones that just involve synthetic media and increasing hypernormal stimuli and ubiquitous deep fakes and really dreadful things like that, right? Like there's, in terms of population-centric warfare and breakdown of government and public trust, and there's a lot that are very, very near term. So this is one set of risks. Anything that the AI can optimize, it can also break. That's kind of the bad actor case. But the other case, the more Molochian case, is just accelerating the thing that is already happening the externalities that aren't included in the optimization function is accelerating the externalities when we're already hitting the tipping points on the externalities. Mm. And so you could say, yeah, but AI is going to make it to where we can produce things so much more efficiently that it'll actually save the environment. Yeah. Um, 
it's not that there isn't a way to do that, and those are the things that I want us to pursue, but we're not on track for that. You've got this kind of Jevons paradox that when you increase the efficiency of energy, you don't actually use less energy, you use more energy because now energy is cheaper, which opens up a whole bunch right. of new markets that weren't open before. The same is true with compute. You make compute cheaper, you use more compute, not less compute. Yeah. And <clears throat> so AI makes some stuff more efficient. More efficient just means there are more things to which I can apply energy to get more energy. As long as there's positive return, we will go for it. Now, to not go for all those things, you can't do with purely incentive. You have to do with deterrent, with agreement, with law, with some other thing, which is not adequate and in speed to the overall situation mm -hmm. right now. So one risk of AI is that anything you can use to optimize, you can also use it to break. It increases all of the other risks in a way nothing else increases all of the other risks. It increases the total complexity of the risk landscape, etc. The other one is that even when you're using it for the positive purposes and you're succeeding at whatever your positive purposes are, you're also speeding up externality right as we're hitting the tipping points. Mm -hmm. The next problem is you're increasing the info complexity. I think Yudkowsky calls it um, inscrutable matrices of floating point numbers, talking about the large language models and like nobody actually knows what the fuck is going on inside of them, right? Mm -hmm. Those kind of black boxes. So the only thing that could figure out is your AI actually doing the thing it's supposed to do or not? How do you, if we wanted a, if we wanted a law in some way to be able to regulate it or adjudicate what's happening, it would take another AI that's more powerful to do it. And so now you end up getting an increase you, of the race towards the info singularity where people can't actually make sense of or adjudicate any of what's happening, right? The total complexity of everything is beyond our ability to process. And that just means the unsolvability of everything increases. So what I'm saying is that if you add something as fastly recursive and powerful as the increasingly generalized AIs that we have to an already misaligned superintelligence near the boundary points of breakdown that's a problem and that we should figure out alignment first so <laughs> what i'm suggesting is in the way that the ai risk community is saying we should really try to figure out alignment before we race forward on developing more powerful ais i'm saying yes we really need to figure out alignment but it doesn't just mean alignment of the ais it means alignment of the existing general intelligences <laughs> the cyber mm -hmm. general intelligence the capitalist model essentially so it's not fair to call it capitalism. It's more like game theory. Capitalism yes. just makes it easy to think about because there is actually a metric. And it, it turns out that that, you know, the capital can be used for population centric warfare or supply chain or most any of those things. It ends up being kind of a unit of power pretty widely. But yes, right. that system that and it's hard to even call it a system, right? That set of um, perverse incentives and the coordinations that arise from it is misaligned, reaching criticality. Alignment in that thing has to be figured out because a misaligned context cannot develop aligned AI. It can't emerge from it. Because that's, I think, some people's hope is that just give it enough capability and some emergent... <laughs> magic will essentially come. This is, I think, why the orthogonality thesis is important, which is to say mm -hmm. it is possible to get very good at optimizing and not get a good at picking good goals, right? Those are mm -hmm. two separate things. And we already see that in the world. We're already much more good at creating tech than we are at creating a world that everybody thinks is a world that really makes sense, right? right. So this is the exponential tech gives us the power of gods. We have not yet seemed to demonstrate the love and wisdom of gods needed to bind it. We have to figure that thing out or this thing kind of caps out. Same with the AI. Well, right. And we've handed it over to the shitty god. <laughs> the, the worst one. So AI has fast enough feedback loops and enough power that it is one of the only things that could help change the other thing in time change the paperclip maximizing nature of the global system, right, of the Moloch mm -hmm. system in time, but only if it was developed in association with the cybernetic systems that were actually aligned. And aligned here doesn't just mean with our intent. Aligned means actually with our 
the, our long-term well-being. And this is one of the critical issues is when we talk about alignment, aligning AIs with human intent would not be great because human intent is not awesome so far, right? Like uh, that's kind of the point is that um, whether we are looking at the overfishing of the oceans or proxy wars or whatever it is, we're like, do we want to give exponentially more power to this species? With its no. intent caught in multipolar traps the way that it is, mm -hmm. it, it is not a good steward of power. In the Bronze mm -hmm. Age, it wasn't. In the Iron Age, it wasn't. It still isn't. But with exponentially more power, exponential externalities and exponential conflict both eventually break the finite playing field. And so how do we... And, you know, solving those coordination failure, multipolar trap type dynamics are necessary for the wisdom to be able to prevail adequately. Um, so I am very hopeful of the very, of the uniquely positive things to support coordination that computational capabilities and artificial intelligence in particular can help with. They are not being developed for those purposes and in contexts that have the right frameworks and the right incentives currently, that it's very much the opposite thing. So rather than build them to be able to change Moloch, they're being built by Moloch in its service. Mm -hmm. Even though no one building them re would say that, but the nature of the capital that they are building it with has that built right into it. Inherently, yeah. So... The, the the sort of aesthetic of the thing that to me is the anti moloch but I don't even like to call it the anti moloch because it is something that operates that by calling it the anti moloch it says it's on the same plane as it, the same dimensionality, and it's something higher than that. Uh, is this thing, you know, if moloch is the god of lose lose games, negative sum games, what's the god of positive sum games? I call it win win. Everyone has different names for it. You call it omnia. It is that the direction of the type of artificial intelligence we need to build? And if so, how would we go about doing that? Could we use a whole bunch of info technologies, including artificial intelligence, including we can already see that all the problems that we saw in the social dilemma that you show in um, your second Moloch video and some in Beauty Wars, the social media related ones. Well, that's, it's, that is actually already a certain kind of AI, right? It's AI that is curating the newsfeed aligned mm -hmm. with an objective function. The objective function is either time on site or engagement or something like that, some combo of metrics. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, if the objective function is to maximize your engagement, things that are addictive will do. Things that More piss you off and tribalize will do. And so it gets to take... Now, what's interesting about the Moloch Part is so far Facebook or TikTok or whatever has not been creating its own content, but it has been incentivizing all people to create content that will rank. And as the people pay attention to what ranks or doesn't, as you saw, beauty filters were one thing and there are a lot of other things, even so far as that all of the legacy media now does stuff that will make it rank on Facebook and Twitter and whatever, because that's increasingly where the eyeballs are coming from. So even that which would seem like an alternative source is still actually influenced by that thing. So the to be able to, because it's so powerful to direct all human attention at the thing right so whatever the algorithm mm -hmm. is it's going to direct all human attention is also going to direct all the innovation in the direction of what wins that algorithm and so <clears throat> and then because it's customizing the newsfeed for every person it's split testing what do the people click on and engage with and share and etc so it's basically just objectively maximizing for personal engagement without paying attention to if it is positive or negative reward circuits. And it happens to be that negative reward circuits are easier to hack than positive ones most of the time. And because mm -hmm. the positive ones, you want to get the fuck off the computer and go do other stuff than, than doom scroll. But the doom scroll mass share thing, the negative reward circuits feed better on. So that's already an example of a bad objective function and an AI that has made it to where there are almost no adolescent girls with a good body image. Right, dysmorphia is kind of ubiquitous. It has made it to where polarization is as extreme as it is, and on and on. Like the externalities are massive. What it's done to attention span, and um, now with synthetic media, we're talking about not just an AI that can curate but can create. Now you can imagine a feedback between those. When 
One is creating things that will be maximally sticky to you based on personal dynamics, split testing multiple created ones. And the other one is curating, but now not just getting all the humans to do decentralized cre creation, but also the it has doing it. You can see that kind of feedback. But of course, if we had, if we change the objective function of social media's AI, right? And rather, and you did things like, uh, it's not just how much engagement it gets, which can be fighting that is polarizing, but mm -hmm. something that, say, gets positive engagement across political divides and ideologic divides and mimetic clusters, which is stuff that we could do, right? We could do, we have mm -hmm. the info science to do that, which means that it's identifying places where there is shared agreement or shared perception and upregulating that rather than the most divisive stuff. You'd have a totally different world and the technology could totally do that. Um, it would not be as good for ad sales right now because it actually wouldn't keep people online quite as long. And so this is where the fiscal model fucks up the application of the tech because we're not just saying all social media is bad. We're saying the incentives make us develop the fucked up versions of it. Right. And so we could make social media that was exposing people to different ideas rather than reinforcing their existing ones and growing their network to include people of very different types and like so similarly can, well, that rewards them to go out and touch grass essentially and you know almost rewards you for time spent off the app or something like that there well, I guess that's probably too there are i mean now one of the challenges is of course the ai coming in and say we're just giving people what they want right? But it's manufacturing demand on bad reward circuits in the same way McDonald's can say we're giving people what we want, but right. you have a much more obese Heroin nation after giving, it. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And so on the other side, you're like, well, it sounds kind of um, uh, paternalistic that we should pick what are the good reward circuits. And But it's like, no, if you're influ if if you have that much asymmetric influence over humans to not take some responsibility for what the statistical changes in their life are is actually silly. Right now, mm -hmm. do we want the corporations to, to do that themselves? Do we want the government to do it? We don't trust any authorities adequately right now for good reasons. So there's some very deep mm -hmm. conversation around how do we ensure that the power of that technology is optimizing for things that actually increase quality of life in meaningful ways. Um, <clears throat> but the same with all new types of AI. Could we use it to radically improve governance where we could actually be able to have the large language models see what people's beliefs and sentiments across the entire space are and find the topics that actually a lot of people agree on, that supermajorities would agree on, and start there and be able to make platforms for candidates to actually be able to represent the, the wills of the people better because we actually can see what they feel and believe at mm -hmm. scale. And um, <clears throat> would it be possible for it to work on identifying things that a lot of people would uh, believe, or at least for it to give information about the stack ranking of the distribution of values to a proposition crafting process so that it could craft better propositions, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not saying that there are not awesome applications, including maybe, maybe with the AI applications that are critical to be able to fix these Moloch dynamics because they can actually help coordination. Right. But if you are not trying to actually understand the coordination failures deeply enough and say, what should we really be trying to solve in terms of fixing coordination that makes this whole technosphere compatible with the biosphere, compatible with human nature, compatible with meaningful definitions of human flourishing, it, <clears throat> if it is as powerful as it is serving anything other than that, the externalities in those areas will become increasingly catastrophic or dystopic or both. Are there any like promising projects that you think are trying to harness AI in a, in this sort of, again, I don't like to say anti monarch in this win-win way, or, you know, using info technologies in a, in a, in a way that is more aligned with what is actually good for human nature in the biosphere. I think we can see like Audrey Tang's work in Taiwan with creating digital democracy where they look for unlikely consensus and they're starting to apply large language models um, and things like that, I, I believe. And, um, and you know, a lot of the work that say the Ethereum and some of the Web3 communities try to do with public goods mm. is obviously thinking about some elements of that. And um, yeah, it's not that nobody is but nobody with the giant capital and GPU farms and et cetera has that as their primary objective. Um, and the primary objectives 
of all of those ones have Moloch and dynamics involved, even if they also have some good dynamics involved. And that's mm -hmm. a problem. And that's what I would most hope to start to shift is in recognition of the total power that is there, the total number of things that will be affected by it, the downstream nth order effects of it, the speed, the nature, the irreversibility. And there is a precautionary principle thing that uh, who's right, Yudkowsky or Cristiano on alignment or whatever it is. Well, given that most of the people who have studied AI alignment very deeply are concerned with the pace and direction with which we're moving, that's a pretty good sign that we should pay mm -hmm. attention. And where there is disagreement between experts, but where there, so there's, where there's radical uncertainty, but also maximum consequentiality and irreversibility, go as fast as possible is not the right answer. What if there was a way to just remove the competition side of it entirely? Like, I know it sounds very pie in the sky, but like if all the major companies you know, which, yes, let's say the companies themselves are as, as by definition misaligned or like aligned with Moloch. But if the companies were to essentially hang up their competition hat, not compete and work together as a sort of single entity, almost like a, you know, a collaborative science project, essentially, would that solve the problem? Fascinatingly, when we talk about the way that laws get built that end up supposedly having good purposes and they do but they also end up being part of Moloch like the fiduciary responsibility of the director or whatever uh, currently I think antitrust laws would try to prevent that thing from happening <laughs> um, that you're mentioning and so the government would actually have to get involved but uh, would I like to see the major uh, AI labs together with the major academic researchers, together with the regulators, take very seriously uh, short, medium, long-term futures of AI that factor all these types of assessments, that factor the Molochian dynamics, the meta crisis, the way that the AI that is the safeties won't totally last, right? They will get decentralized. The safeties will be taken off. It will be used for all purposes, the kind of omni-use nature of it. And mm -hmm. to look at what does responsible movement forward in light of that look like. I, um, I don't see any good answers that don't involve that. Yeah, because that's the thing. The one thing Moloch requires, you know, one thing game theory requires is competition of some kind, some kind of either fabricated or real scarcity. And in this instance, there isn't really, you know, er there are no intellectual powerhouses trying to compete to be the first to do a thing. Everyone is working on the same project together. It's the ultimate cooperation thing. Um, but yes, it seems like a very almost intractable solution, you know, uh, method because it would actually need to be an international collaboration as well. It's not just, you know, I mean, we do have the one advantage that it seems like the majority of the major players at least are all in Western hemisphere and they all speak the same language and to a degree share similar values. Um, you know, we're not, well, maybe not so much that, but that is one starting point. Um, there are some very advanced AI labs in China. Um, and the government run ones versus the corporate ones are slightly different. Um, there's obviously AI that is not just large language models for public deployment that is still also risky for many other purposes. I think the the large language models for public deployment is a unique case because when the whole world starts uh, utilizing them for the many, many purposes they will, it'll become nearly impossible to roll it back once we see the risks that are associated because we will have created so much economic and cultural dependence on it. Um, so I think even if all we're talking about is, as a start, all of the major GPU farms and large language models being in cooperation, that would be a thing. But I do think it does need to be uh, wider than that, and not just corporate um, and international. Uh, and I think the... I don't think there are any existential risks near term if we don't. I don't think large language models destroy the world. I think there will be 
problems and then we'll create solutions to those and whatever. But I think it absolutely accelerates the overall metacrisis across many, many vectors, which is why one has to actually take that seriously to then really try to take responsibility for this thing for which right. there is so much incentive to not take responsibility. Absolutely. Is there any like specific call to action you want to put out there if there happen to be any, you know, major techno technologists listening to this? I mean, to to begin with, it's really to engage with the wider risk arguments, not just in super intelligent AGI taking off, but the um, acceleration of all of the risks that the release of these things cause to really engage with those arguments seriously and to really th think about the world that's creating and be like, all right, despite the humongous incentive for me to rush ahead with this, uh, is the risk calculus high enough, the speed and the irreversibility high enough that I am actually um, inclined to figure out something, to, to figure out better coordination around this and to simply start engaging in um, more percentage of their total energy going into risk analysis than opportunity advancement, to have that more attached to the actual governance and choice making I think all companies working on AGI should kill the fiduciary agreement to maximize shareholder profit. Obviously, um, some have talked about that. I think that should be killed. Uh, and I think the earnest real engagement between the AI labs, the people in AI safety research, and um, regulators should be a very actively happening thing. Don't be more lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I... <laughs> You can print me one of those bumper stickers. 